So um, we're on viruses, and I just went ahead and posted right on our page um, the full PowerPoint right here under the student version of the PowerPoint. And then, of course, here's that virus model, and I actually brought mine in today that's attached to the poster that a student of mine did in the past on the dengue virus. Um, she had the actual infection, so she, she actually has her uh, blood reports and everything there. And um, then I have, um, I guess these are called rector sets or something like that nowadays. Um, so Marion Friedstadt, who I probably mentioned before, she's our resident virologist here. That's her background. <laughs> Um, she teaches mostly the biology courses, so if you might have had her for biology, um, the 141 and 143's general biology for science majors. And this was her sunset, but he's older now, so he doesn't play with these things. So we made um, virus models out of them, and she uh, was kind enough to give one to me. So this is that isohedral, um, very common shape um, for the viruses. And what, what pro I answer my own question. What molecules are these made out of? Proteins. They're made out of proteins, right? And then they sometimes form characteristic um, arrangements where you have, say, five together. What do we call those? Ten pentamers, and then six hexamers, right? And so for the, for the dengue virus, if you look closely, I think there are five blue ones, uh, five blue proteins that kind of form a point. Um, that, of course, since it's five, would be a pentamer, where you're having that organization. Um, I don't think they have where you have the six, but usually you have either the five or six or both when you have this shape, where you have those um, proteins coming together to form this characteristic shape. So we're going to go ahead and pass this one around so that you guys can touch and feel. Please just don't take it apart. <laughs> I have not slooper glued it together. I haven't committed to that shape. Um, so, and then if, like I said, if you print out this virus model here and you fold it up, it'll look just like that one um, on the board. And it is the proteins and how they're arranged for that particular virus. There's lots of them out on the internet nowadays that you can print out and fold up and have fun with your kids on a rainy day like today, right? <laughs> it's apparently coming our way. You could go home and fold viruses, right, if you really wanted to. Uh, so one other assignment that I posted for you guys, um, and that would be found under our modules. And oh, what I wanted to point out too is that we're going to go to genetics next. Because uh, genetics is really tough, right? So that's going to be the next one that I'll post the student didacted um, lecture for um, sometime hopefully today. Uh, if I don't lose internet, right? <laughs> uh, but I'll work. Even though I'll bring the kid home, I'll throw him on the computer, and I'll get on my computer. Got to love that nowadays, right? That is if the power doesn't get cut off from the Yeah, that's true. Then we'll play board games. <laughs> we got those, too. Okay. Just no tornadoes, right? Fingers and toes crossed on that. So under our exam one, everyone has taken the exam now, so you should have got an announcement from me on Friday um, that you can now review your exam. Um, and as I as I talked, up, uh, talked about before, you can click here, and it explains again that you can't print. Um, how testing is done, it's a, my whole course is objective based, right? You can see the objectives linked to each one of the questions when you look at the test. And this gives you kind of an example how you should prepare for the final exam. Here's the link so that you can actually download that program at home. But also remember, um, up here on um, the second floor in the Open Computer Lab, they do have this program on their desktop. This is what the icon looks like. Ooh, where's my picture? There should be a picture right there, and it's not showing up. <laughs> That bites, but okay. We'll go to my desktop. I'll show you. There's the icon right there. That's what it looks like, right? So it looks like a little lock. It says lockdown browser. So you have to have everything else closed on your computer. So I can't open it right now because it's going to ask me to shut everything down, including my recording program, which wouldn't do me any good, right? But click on that. It takes you right to Canvas. You log in. You click back on your test. And one thing that we noticed that was kind of tricky for people, which, of course, I won't let me right now because I'm not in lockdown browser, but 
when you click on your test, which you might let me because I'm an instructor, I get to override the rules, right? <laughs> uh, to review your results, um, they should, might be right when you open it like this, or there might be something in this area where you have to click um, and say, view my results. And then you'll see it as you do here. And of course, I just clicked on it. I didn't actually take the test, so I got a zero out of 10, out of 100, right? Everyone, I could see the shocked faces like, oh my God, Miss Erica failed the test. I didn't actually take it. I just clicked on it, y'all. <laughs> um, pretty sure I'd get 100 if I took it. Uh, but so you can see here, especially if you get them wrong, you're going to have this big red arrow, right? And it's going to be pointing to the correct answer. But what I also really want you guys to focus in is what objective was this, right? What objective? And you can usually tell by the question too, right? What objective that matched up with. So if you got that one wrong, you really need to review that entire objective, right? So students always ask me all the time for a final exam study guide. This is it, y'all. <laughs> this is it. You have it already. The objectives are your study guide for the entire course, right? You can make your own specialized final exam study guide by opening up your test and reviewing it. Anything you missed, you better review. Anything you don't remember, you better review. Anything that's on a test has a 50-50 chance of that objective, not question, that objective being on the final exam. Okay? This is your final exam study guide. And you can tailor it to you as you should. All right? Make sense? All right, so enough about testing. Um, but related to testing, after you review your results, right, before we come back on Tuesday, I want you to, and it's under the exam module, I want you to complete this quick assignment. It's under the exam module, Erica, <laughs> called the agreement. Uh, and this is about six questions, um, really simple, that I want you to answer um, before, after you review your exam, but before coming back to class on Tuesday, okay? It requires, as you notice, the lockdown browser. So after you review your test, go ahead and click on this, answer these quick questions, right? Hit submit, and you're done, okay? They're really easy questions. Yeah, see? Bridget already did it. She said, yes, they were. Right. Okay, so moving on to today's lecture, finally. So last time we were talking about these shapes, right? So we're passing around that really cool isohedral model shape. And then after class, if you have time, but those of you guys that are in lab, this poster should look familiar to you, right? It's up hanging every single day about yeah, it's in the lab. So I stole it out of the lab today, right? Uh, so uh, those of you guys that have the privilege of taking lab right now, right, you have exposure to this poster by, uh, by being in the lab. But if you're curious and you want to read up on it, right, and look at it more, anytime during my office hours that the lab is free, if you come by and you say, I want to go look at the, the virus poster, I'll bring you in the lab and we go look at, talk about the virus poster again. So again, this is just a project that a student had done in the past when I used to have um, 210 students do projects. And since she had a viral infection, she decided to do her poster on that particular uh, dengue virus. Um, and it just so happens that that was uh, the model that I found when I was searching on the internet. It was kind of one of those really cool coincidences, right? It all came together for us. Uh, so uh, these guys are super cool. Um, notice it does have, it almost looks like an isohedral, but it's not. Um, but it has that protein coat, but then other protein appendages, right? This guy looks like a crazy spaceship. Uh, I did see the end of X-Files last night, but most of it I didn't watch because I was actually doing schoolwork. <laughs> but, you know, um, for me, that's what I see when I see that. I see a spaceship. But they do land on bacterial cells very similar to a spaceship does and actually attach to it. And they compress and inject their nucleic acid into the cell. So there's a bunch of YouTube videos out there. I haven't linked one particularly to our course yet. Um, but if you find one you really like, right, um, send me the link and I'll post it for us. 
So many viruses are bound by an additional layer. So other than just that protein, some of them have a membranous like layer. And again, notice we're saying membranous. It's not an actual membrane. I thought I turned this off. Or is that someone else stinging? Nope, that's me. So it is not, in fact, a membrane, right? But um, as you'll find out, it actually is sometimes made from our own membranes, right? So they modify our membranes to make their envelopes for a lot of the enveloped viruses. So this membranous-like layer is referred to as an envelope. And viruses that infect eukaryotic cells, they're going to make proteins in addition, their proteins, right? Because in our membranes are our proteins for our utilization. They've got to make their own envelope proteins. And they'll stick these into the envelope layer. And a lot of them tend to stick out, so they're commonly referred to as spikes. But you'll also see the pleplomers term, but I'll always stick to spikes. So when you look at these pictures, here is the rabies virus, right? It has these characteristic spikes. Um, here's a herpes virus. You see these characteristic spikes sticking out of the envelope. So it, it was, uh, first they thought that um, viruses didn't have enzymes. But come to find out that they do have some enzymes. And they carry those along with their nucleic acid inside the capsid. Or a lot of times those spikes, those proteins in the envelope, some of those are enzymes as well. And so enzymes catalyze reactions, right? Help reactions to proceed forward. And especially for some of these viruses, oh, that's what I just remembered what I wanted to steal and I forgot. So remember I told you guys I was reviewing a new book and they had a really cool diagram? I totally forgot to steal it. But I'll, I'll, I'll do that today and post it for you guys. Um, cause it's really, it's really good when it comes to, you know, the next topic, which is the nucleic acid itself and how it is that an RNA virus, how can it exist, right? Um, because as we know, the flow of information, right, goes from DNA to RNA to proteins in our cells. So we have enzymes that can, you know, convert DNA into RNA and then R messenger RNA into proteins. Now, of course, the major complex that converts messenger RNA into proteins is what? What binds to the messenger RNA and makes proteins? Ribosomes. ribosomes, right? And only cells have those. So these viruses are not coming with ribosomes, right? But they might be coming with other enzymes needed to maybe copy their RNA, right? Especially when they're RNA viruses. So those types of enzymes they're coming with, the stuff we don't have. But they always are utilizing our ribosomes to make their proteins. They just got to make sure they make a messenger RNA that our ribosome can read. And then that our ribosomes are going to make the proteins for them. This, this is true for any cell that a virus infects, right? The most important thing that they're utilizing enzymatically is our ribosomes to make their proteins. And a lot of proteins have enzymatic function, right? Can do things, make things. For them, the most important thing, because basically a virus is just nucleic acid, right? And a protein coat. So they've got to be able to make proteins. They've got to be able to copy their nucleic acid. And sometimes that can be difficult, depending on what type of nucleic acid we're dealing with. So that's our next objective, is looking at these nucleic acids. So remember, for viruses, 
They either have DNA or RNA. They don't have both. Right? It's either one or the other. Now, DNA, typically when we talk about it, how many strands do we have? Two. It's double-stranded, right? So the designation for our DNA would be DSDNA, for double-stranded DNA. But DNA can exist single-stranded. That would be SS. For us, of course, that's not the case. But for some viruses, their nucleic acid, their DNA, is single-stranded. They just have one strand. Or it can be double-stranded like ours. It can be linear like ours, right? Straight lines. Or it can even be circular like you see in bacteria where it forms a circle, a closed circle. Now RNA typically in our cells is what? Single-stranded or double-stranded? Single. It's single-stranded. It's single-stranded, a single strand. This is true for our messenger RNA, right? And this is why the ribosome can read it. This is true for our transfer RNAs, although they form um, an ultrastructure where they um, inner strand bind with each other, but it's still just one strand, right? Remember the transfer RNAs look kind of like little T's? Yeah. Um, but that's still just one strand, right, that binds with itself in different regions to form that structure. So for us, it's all single-stranded RNA. That's how it functions, right? That's how it best serves us. Same is true for ribosomal RNA that's associated with the ribosome. It's single-stranded that complexes with the protein. Double-stranded RNA does exist for some viruses, right? So they have two strands of RNA. And, of course, the designation is DS for that. So the good news for you guys <laughs> is you don't have to know, and even I don't have to know, so a lot of times I forget, <laughs> right? Uh, but a lot of times when scientists talk about viruses, they will say such and such virus is a DNA virus or an RNA virus. Or they may even go one step further and say it's single-stranded or double-stranded. Right. Because that type of information is important as it relates to that virus. So they have either single-stranded or double-stranded RNA or DNA. The size of the nucleic acid also varies from virus to virus. Right? How many nucleotides long is it? How, mu how many proteins does it code for? Is it linear or is it circular? And again, each virus, you would be able to answer these questions for that specific virus. For you guys, you just need to know in general that, that these possibilities exist, right? That a virus could be DNA or RNA, double-stranded or single-stranded. It can be circular. It can be linear. So also on the Internet, in addition to, like, the capsids, you can print out, like, for some of the viruses, like, they have the, the DNA or the RNA code, right? You can print out strips of nucleic acid abbreviations, um, A, T's, G's, and C's, depending, or A, U, right? Um, so for some viruses, they know this information. So you cut yourself out little strips and stuff them inside your, your nucleocapsid. You can make a nucleocapsid where you have the nucleic acid surrounded by the capsid, the protein coat. So, as I kind of alluded to earlier, right, this can create a problem when you're an RNA virus because our system, our enzymes are used to going from RNA, I mean, excuse me, from DNA to RNA to protein. So, what happens if we, have, we start right at RNA? And what if that strand of RNA is single-stranded? Well, the thing is, for our enzymes to read RNA, it has to be a particular strand made from a particular side of the DNA, or a particular direction, I should say, of the DNA. Um, so what we call plus strand or 
positive strand RNA is RNA that can be read by the ribosome. It is equivalent to messenger RNA. So I always think positive, green light, we're ready to go, no problems here. If the, DNA, if the RNA is single-stranded, and that single strand is negative strand RNA, which means it's the opposite of positive, so the information is going in the wrong direction, the ribosome cannot read this. So it can't be translated right away. Right? The ribosome cannot attach to this negative strand RNA and read it and make proteins. Right, it cannot be read. I was thinking it was on there, but it's not. Okay. So, plus or positive RNA viruses, as I said, are the same as our messenger RNA. Ribosome can attach, read it right away. Make a protein. No problems. The influenza virus, to give you an example of a real thing, is an RNA virus. It's single-stranded. It requires, it brings with it its own enzyme. This enzyme is an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which means that it needs RNA to make RNA. So in order for this cell, right, to make copies, excuse me, in order for the cell to make copies for the virus, right, because the virus is just RNA, we have no DNA, right? We can't go DNA, RNA like our cells are used to. Our cells don't make copies of RNA. They don't do it. So this virus has to come with its own enzyme that will copy its own RNA so it can replicate itself. So that's what they mean by replicase, meaning that it's just going to make copies of that RNA. And the, it has an RNA transcriptase. This converts the RNA that it is into messenger RNA. And this is very important because this is what the ribosomes need to make the proteins that are going to make up the capsid, the protein coat. And if it's an envelope virus, which this one is, to make those spikes, those protein uh, components of the envelope. So the influenza virus is what we call an RNA, a negative RNA virus. Right? It's single-stranded, but in addition, it's not the same as messenger RNA. We've got to do these additional steps. For that virus to be able to copy its components using the cell's machinery. So it's still going to use the cell's ribosomes. They always do. Right? But the cell does not contain an enzyme that's going to copy RNA into RNA. Or transcribe RNA into RNA. We don't do that. Replicase is making a copy. Strand transcriptase, remember, a transcript is messenger RNA, right? So when it when it's it's actually creating a copy, but a reverse copy, so that now it's messenger RNA. It's a complementary copy, you could say. The the transcriptase, yeah. It's complementary, yeah. This is not in the right direction for the ribosome to be able to read it. Yeah, this is negative, right? This is, influenza is negative. I realize I don't have it written there. I probably need to update that slide. Okay, so what's the life cycle of these guys? And again, you know, we word, use the word life. 
but most of us don't believe these to be living, right? But this is the cycle that it goes through, you could say, to replicate itself. And different types of viruses and different type of hosts are going to have variations of this general um, steps that all of them have to go through. So you need to be able to list in order the general reproduction cycle. So notice I called it reproduction cycle there of a virus. And then identify how viruses accomplish entry into plants, vertebrate animals, and bacteria. Because that's one of the key differences in this cycle is the entry point. How do they get in or what gets in? So for general purposes, the very first thing that has to happen for all viruses is they must attach to the cell they're going to infect. And then entry has to happen. Now, for some virus is in their host, the whole virus enters into the cell. Others, like the bacterial phage that I talked about, it just injects its nucleic acid. And that's what you see in this picture. You just see the nucleic acid going into the cell, not the capsid. So we'll go over the differences, but the important thing is entry happens. Something, right, enters that cell, whether it's the nucleic acid and its enzymes, the whole virus particle, the viron, something's got to enter. Then once it enters in, of course, it takes over that cell. It's going to cause that cell to become a virus-making factory to synthesize the viral proteins and the viral nucleic acid. And as we've already alluded to, right, when you're single-stranded RNA, this creates some problems, right, because you've got to come with your own enzymes, and you've got to do some additional steps. And then, of course, the nucleic acid and the proteins need to assemble. They apparently do this all on their own. These molecules know who goes with who and how to arrange. But leaving that cell can also vary depending on the viruses, especially for envelope viruses. Because envelope viruses are going to convert that cell's membrane into their envelope. So here it's showing a non-enveloped or what we call a naked virus. It's just its nucleic acid and the capsid. So what we would call a nucleocapsid. And they're just busting out of that cell. So entry, as I said, it differs, it depends. And what really depends here is the cell that the virus is trying to get into. So think about this. Plant viruses normally can enter plants only if mechanical abrasion or an insect assists. So what is stopping a virus normally from getting into a plant cell that's not injured? Cell wall. The cell wall, right? All plant cells have a cell wall. So that creates a pretty strong barrier um, that would make it really hard for a virus to get in. Well, as we know, right, damage happens. Insects poke holes in them. Um, even wind, strong winds in a storm can damage plant cells so that virus can enter in. So they can get in. They just need some assistance. Vertebrate viruses only infect certain tissues in certain organs because there are specific interactions between the receptors on the cells and the host cells. So that first level of attachment really dictates on whether entry is going to happen. So especially for us, so the example here is the measles virus. The receptors are present on most of our cells. So the measles virus gets into a lot of our cells. Where the polio virus, on the other hand, the receptor is only present on a few, a select few cells. So the infection is localized. So my newest example that I love, that really shows you the importance of, of genetics too, is there's a tribe in Africa uh, that they found 
that are immune to HIV infection. Because what's the first step? Attachment, right? So there's some receptor, there's something on our cells that these viruses are attaching to, right? That their proteins are able to link up with. These particular people, the HIV virus attacks our helper uh, lymphocytes, our helper T lymphocytes. On those cells is a receptor that those cells use to communicate with the immune system called the CD4 marker. That particular marker, theirs is so different from everyone else's that the virus cannot attach to it. So they're genetically immune to HIV. It's not something we can harvest for a treatment, right? Wouldn't that be awesome, right? But it's really great for them and just shows you that evolutionarily wise, right, changes happen and they can, you can win the genetic lottery in that case, right? They won the genetic lottery as it applies to HIV anyways. Have you heard of uh, somebody's genetically HIV virus and they have to go through a banana? Okay, what? Is that? God, no. Yeah, is that even, like, possible for, like, the virus to live in the banana? Hmm? Hmm. Oh, Lord Jesus. Yeah. That was like, yeah, it was floating around, but, yeah. Um, I'm hoping, I'm praying for urban myth, okay? I'm not even going to repeat what she said, um, but, uh, oh God, I guess i got to repeat it. Okay, so apparently someone is injecting HIV blood into fruits, okay? Um, yeah, that could, that could make you sick because um, people can be evil. Pretty much the reason why, I mean... I don't know what other constraints for HIV. Like, I don't know what conditions can it survive under. I honestly don't know. And I don't want to, I don't even want an educated guess. I don't want to touch that one. <laughs> I really don't. You just terrified me if, if, you're, if, you're, if you really want to know the truth. Okay, moving on. And I like the whole class, but um, so... Yeah, we'll, we'll, um, that's one of those things we can investigate, and I, I probably will. So I will let you know. <laughs> I would say the most, um, if you ever run into, like, this is the, this is the horrible thing about social media, y'all. <laughs> is that people put really crazy stuff out there, um, that can be plausible, can be possible, um, to scare people, right? Which they just succeeded right now. Um, <laughs> uh, your most up-to-date, best source of accurate information on the internet, so this is a good teaching moment, um, is the CDC's uh, site. Um, this is Centers of Disease Control, so cdc.gov, right, for government site. Um, and, and this is where I would suggest searching first to answer those types of questions. Right, uh, and then of course, as it applies to the internet, we still have what is it called? Snoops, Snopes, Snopes, whatever. There's a website where they're always updating urban myths. Right, so I'm praying that this one is already on that site, saying it's an urban myth. That this isn't really CDC, Centers of Disease Control, CDC. So, we'll check those two places. Right and come back to this. And like I said, I'm praying urban myth. Okay, moving on. So the first um, thing for getting into a cell, for envelope viruses, uh, a lot of them, of course, are going to infect um, organisms like ourselves that have membranes and no cell walls, right? So one of the ways they can gain entry is that their envelope which of course has spikes in it, these proteins that commonly are going to interact with receptors found on our cells. This allows the attachment, the specific attachment to happen. And one of the things that can happen next is the envelope can fuse with the membrane. So basically the membrane and the envelope fuse together and the nucleocapsid, the nucleic acid and the protein enter into the cell. 
that's referred to as fusion with the host membrane. That's one way that enveloped viruses, again, it has to have that envelope to fuse with the membrane. So I don't have any specific infection examples of this. It's very common. Um, and then the next is endocytosis, right? So a lot of eukaryotic cells, including our own cells, do endocytosis, where they'll take things in a membranous vacuole that they create. So in this case, again, you still have that first level of attachment of the envelope interacting with the proteins in it with our receptors, but that's gonna, that interaction induces our cells to engulf the virus, to take our membrane and surround the virus, its entire particle, including its envelope, into a vacuole. This vacuole gets coated. It becomes an endosome, but unfortunately for us, this endosome is going to convert and peel off the envelope of the virus. So it's going to attach, right, and kind of fuse, but this fusion is happening within our cells. And then the nucleo nucleocapsid is released, the nucleic acid and the capsid, the protein coat, into the cell. So instead of fusing with the membrane, the envelope is fusing with an endosome, right? Because we've taken it in by endocytosis. Now for naked viruses, remember naked implies the fact that they're missing what layer? Mm -mm. All viruses are nucleic acid and a protein coat, which is the capsid. What does it not have here? It doesn't have an envelope. It doesn't have an envelope. And that's somewhat bad news for us, right, because it's a much more stable virus, so the chemicals and stuff that we use to clean tend not to disrupt this protein coat, although the membranous layer, that envelope layer, is pretty sensitive to chemicals that we use to clean, right? So naked viruses still get that protein coat, so we still have that protein interaction with receptors on the cell. We're going to have that attachment happen. And then that, again, can induce endocytosis, where we take it in, we take our membrane and surround that enveloped, that non-enveloped, that naked virus. In this case, instead of peeling off an envelope, there's no envelope, right? So the nucleic acid just comes out of this endosome. The protein component stays within the endosome. And again, the important information is in that nucleic acid, right? If it's DNA, we're going to make messenger RNA from it. We're going to make the viral proteins for it. We're going to even copy the DNA for the new baby viruses. If it's RNA, then we're going to have those additional steps potentially especially if it's single-stranded. So some viruses inject only their nucleic acid, where others have to ensure that a virus-encoded RNA or DNA polymerase also enters, right? Again, it just depends on what type of virus is it. Is it an RNA? Is it a DNA? Is it double-stranded? Is it single-stranded? But when it comes to bacteria, again, what's going to keep that whole virus from getting into the cell? The cell wall, right? That cell wall, right, isn't going to allow endocytosis to happen. So instead, they attach again via their proteins, and then they're going to inject their nucleic acid and any enzymes they have into the cell.
Now, phage is a short name for bacterial phage. These are specific viruses that infect bacteria. And mainly the focus, right, because this is a microbiology course, although, as we've said, right, we can get infected as well, right? All of us are, unfortunately, very familiar with viral infections, <laughs> having experienced them. So most double-stranded RNA viruses use their DNA genome as a template for messenger synthesis. This is normally what happens in our cells, right? So our cells have got all the enzymes, they will do this for them, right? That messenger RNA then can be made into the viral proteins. RNA viruses, as we've already said, often require additional steps to direct protein synthesis, to make that protein coat for that virus, or the spikes that are going to need to be inserted into the membrane. We're talking about enveloped. Complex self-assembly process happens. It involves, of course, the viral proteins as well as some host cell factors. And for some viruses, large paracrystalline clusters at the site of maturation will form. And that is one of the new pictures. I end, I, uh, similar <laughs> phenomenon happens in our cells. So the very last slide of this PowerPoint is actually a new one. It actually shows some pictures similar to that. So for viruses that infect bacteria, so the T4 is the name of a phage, a, a virus that infects E. coli, a bacteria. About 150 viral particles are released when the cell lyses. So again, you've got this small problem of you got your nucleic acid in, right? The cell copied the nucleic acid. It copied the proteins. We've assembled. <laughs> but now you're stuck inside the cell. How do you get out? Well, membranes are pretty easy to bust through. Cell walls, not so much. So for bacterial viruses, they come with their own enzymes. They have lysozyme which will deteriorate. It's an enzyme that breaks down the cell wall. We actually produce it as well, right, to be able to destroy bacterial cell walls. It particularly, specifically, will break the sugars in peptidoglycan apart, right? It'll just chew it up. And then holin is an enzyme that's going to, as its name implies, poke holes in the plasma membrane. So then these guys can come busting out of that poor dead bacteria. Well, this is a virus that particularly infects bacteria, specifically E. coli. So to give you a specific example. Yeah, but that was also in us with those little viruses. Yeah, um, bacteria viruses aren't going to infect our cells because, again, it's that specific interaction, right? They're going to attach to the bacterial cell. We don't have the same receptors on our cells. They're not going to attach to our cells. They're just going to attach to the bacteria. Does that make sense to you guys? So remember, viruses are pretty host-dependent, and even as far as our bodies, sometimes even tissue or even, in the case of HIV, pretty cell-specific. Right? There's one other cell type that it attacks, but the one that really debilitates us is the fact that it kills off our helper uh, T cells, our cytotoxic, I mean our helper T cells, our CD4 T cells. Why my brain just can't keep them straight this morning. Okay, so all viral envelopes are derived from the host cell membranes. So you don't have envelope viruses popping out of bacterial cells, right? This is pretty much just animal cells um, that produce enveloped viruses. Naked viruses usually just lice out of the cell, right? They're just the nucleic acid, the protein coat. They don't need the cell. They just bust out of it. Where the envelope viruses, that formation of the envelope and release usually occur together because they're using the membrane, right, to convert it into their envelope. So they're going to take their proteins and incorporate them into the host cell's membrane. And then the nucleic acid and that protein coat, what we call the nucleocapsid, 
is going to attach to that modified section of the membrane that's now an envelope. And they'll surround themselves and kind of bud off, right? So they're going to kind of... Um, and if you guys did the homework assignment, right, you kind of saw the animation of it kind of budding off. Yeah, one of those, right? Um, not only in the homework assignment, but remember, under the modules, I have animations. Oh, I lose internet. Damn it. All right, I'm not going to go to that now. <laughs> but they're there. <laughs> you can just watch the animations by themselves. Um, but here's a non-animated view. So for influenza, oh, now it decides to go to the internet. Here we go. Well, I have to reload the page though. Yeah, there we go. So here is, here, mechanism for releasing enveloped vi uh, virons. So you see the nucleocapsid, right? So this is the nucleic acid in the protein. And here's the proteins that the virus makes and sticks into the membrane. So now the nucleocapsid is going to get associated with that. There's a matrix that forms so it knows where to go. And then it's going to get surrounded by its envelope. So for influenza, those spikes, there are two important spikes. One is known as hemagglutin, and one is known as neuroaminodase. Um, and as the name implies, ACE, ACE, A-S-E, usually refers to, what does that do? It's an enzyme. It's an enzyme. So there's the clue there, right? Hemagglutin. Hema, hem, hema, hem, a gluten, right? So heme refers to what? Here's my medical terminology, blood, right? So they found that this would cause this particular protein found in the envelope of the influenza virus would cause uh, blood to clump. But it is the one that's important to, why is it causing our blood to clump? because it'll attach to those cells, right? The hemagglutin of the influenza virus appears to be involved in the attachment to host receptors, right? So this is the very important protein for those guys that they're going to use to stick to us, to attach. And then they're going to gain entry. Now, of course, this is showing them leaving the cell, right? This is showing them leaving. The other is an enzyme, and this one comes into play once the virus is inside of our cells. Once it's inside of our cells, it shuts down the receptor that the hemagglutin binds to. So the virus gets in, right, that enzyme gets activated, and it shuts down the receptor that hemagglutin binds to. So what does that mean? That virus got in, right? He shut down all the receptors on that cell. So no more viruses get into that cell. No more influenza viruses get into that cell. He just claimed it is my cell. He said, no, this one's mine. You can't have it. Right? Influenza virus is very greedy. One virus per cell. Like They, they don't like to share their space with any of their friends. This is bad news for us, right? Because if you inhale a thousand viruses, how many of your cells get attacked? A thousand. And then if hundreds of them bust out of your cell, hundreds more of your cells get infected. Yeah. This prevents what's referred to as super infection, where more than one virus gets into a cell at a time. But this really helps to them spread. Right, because they're not going to make the mistake of going in somewhere where someone else is already there. 
they shut down the doors. They lock the doors like, this is my cell, right? Just like when you go into the restroom, right? You lock the door because you don't want anyone else in there with you, right? They lock the door like, mm -mm, this one's mine. Move on to the next one. But that's why it spreads so rapidly, right? Because only one per cell. Make sense? Kind of frightening, but true. <laughs> All right. So what we pretty much looked at so far is the lytic cycle. But another uh, viral cycle does exist. It's referred to as the lysogenic. In only temperate phages, so remember phage is another name for a virus that infects bacteria, can do this process we refer to as lysogeny. Um, so temperate phages have two reproductive options. They can go lytically and when they're when they're doing like we, we're used to, right? Attaching, entering in, copying, assembling, and busting back out of that cell. It's referred to as a virulent phage, right? It's in the virulent cycle. But ones that remain within the host cell without destroying it, I've said to undergone the relationship called lysogeny. So the tempered phage is like, nah, I'm not going to be virulent, right? I'm going to just hang out here and coexist with my friend, Mr. Bacteria. This happens for us, too, with some infections, right? Can anyone think of a virus that gets into our cells and actually doesn't bust out of our cells but stays there? HIV can do it. Once infected, always infected. Herpes. Right? When you have a cold sore or a genital sore, that's when that temperate or what we refer to as a latent virus goes into the lytic cycle. When it's not in the lytic cycle, it's hiding inside of our cells. It's what we call latent. It's incorporated into our DNA. When our cells divide, it copies that information too. When it goes into the lytic cycles, when our cells are dying is when you have those sores. But once that virus gets into your body, into your cells, you cannot get rid of it. Like I said, my husband's lucky I kiss him, but he's never had a cold sore. Right? Even when someone doesn't have a cold sore, right, if you come in contact or, or get transferred cells that are infected, you can get it that way. The, you're more likely to get the virus, of course, when they have an active sore. And this includes both places depending on what you do, right? There's two different types of herpes viruses, type 1 and type 2. Type 1 you typically get as cold sores. Type 2 is what we refer to as genital herpes, right, genital sores, which tends to be erupt more often and be more painful. I love those commercials on TV, right? about how they're taking such and such drug, right, and their partner hasn't gotten herpes. I'm like, yeah, you forgot a big word, yet. <laughs> because the, what's the drug they're, what, what is that drug that they're taking? It's suppressing, it's suppressing the virus from going to the lytic cycle, right? And of course, during the lytic is when you're most likely to pass on the infection. Does that mean it can't happen when you don't have an eruption? No, it can so notice the word yet, right? The probability over your lifetime, not so good, right? But the good news is you can take drugs, right? And you could both not have very common occurrences of having sores. Yeah. Okay. Anyone know another one? We actually get vaccinated against it now. Chickenpox. Chickenpox. Chickenpox is in that same herpes family of viruses. So we usually joke because what's the reactivation of herpes? I mean, of 
shingles. shingles, right? So someone who had chicken pox, right? And, and nowadays, if you mm -hmm. was was in 1995, I think is when the vaccine starts. So my son's been vaccinated; he'll never go through chicken pox, unlike I did. Um, I never had but chicken pox when I was a kid. You should get vaccinated. Um, and <laughs> what? Because <laughs> you don't want to get in as an adult. Trust me. Yeah. 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 No, ninety-five though. I think no, it was ninety-five. It was ninety-two. Oh, okay. But approved and widely given in ninety-five. Okay. Okay. So now it's given to you know all young children, right? Um, so I actually had the infection. A lot of us that you know are older experience the infection, and probably experience what's known as chicken pox parties because your mom would purposely take you to someone else's house whose kids had chicken pox before you went to school. So when I was four, I had the chicken pox because I went to a chicken pox party and, and contracted chicken pox so that I would get it before I went to school, right? Um, so that way I didn't miss two weeks of school. My little sister went to a lot of chicken pox parties. She must be a very clean player or did not, because it's respiratorily transmitted when you have chicken pox, she obviously did not get close to any of those chicken pox kids. She never got it until she was in high school. Two weeks of school she missed, right? Uh, and that's the main reason, right, why parents would do something like that, right? Is that eventually you're going to get it anyways. It's in the population. Um, the good news is when it reactivates, it's no longer respiratory, respiratorily transmitted, right? The bad news is it reactivates in your sensory nerve ganglion where it hid, and that's extremely painful, right, when it reactivates. And then, of course, if you're a professor here, we walk around and say you have herpes, right? Because we think it's funny. That's what scientists do, right? You get it, right? It's a herpes virus. You have herpes when shingle, when you have shingles. Um, so what's the shingles virus? I mean, the shingles vaccine, it's a booster of the chicken pox vaccine. Just different dosage. That's all it is, right? Making sure your immune system knows what this guy is and keeps it under control. That's the issue there. So for, for these temperate phages and for, you know, herpes and chicken pox, this is a similar thing that, you know, when it's going through the lytic cycle, it's reproducing, it's busting out of our cells, getting into other cells, and it's just going around and around, and we've got that cellular destruction, right? We've got the pox, the characteristic pox of chicken pox or the characteristic sores associated with herpes virus. Or there's going to be periods of time where it's going to incorporate into our DNA. In the case of bacterial viruses, when it's incorporated, it's referred to as a prophage. And as I said, it gets copied when the cells divide. Same is true for us um, with herpes. It, it usually will stay hidden unless something triggers it to then come out of the chromosome and then enter into the lytic cycle. This introduction could be something as simple as UV damage. For us, usually, it's a wane in our immune system, um, where our immune system is compromised. We have some other infection. Um, unfortunately, for people going through chemotherapy, right, this is really going to damage the immune system, not be able to keep those things under check. They'll typically get shingles or reactivations of herpes. Um, when do you see cold sores during the semester? Final exams, pay attention, right? People don't eat properly, they don't sleep, and they're stressed. This significantly affects your immune system. And so usually that's when you see people walking around with cold sores, right? Because it's reactivated. For, so when it's integrated, it's referred to as a prophage. Lysogens or lysogenic bacteria, these are, are infected bacterial hosts that have a temperate phage inside them, right, and can go into lysogeny where it's just staying inside the cell. They tend to be immune to superinfection as well, because think about this. If you had more than one that got in and incorporated into your cell, then it would really disrupt that cell's DNA and probably kill that cell. 
So you really only want one of those viruses in one cell. Right? There isn't room for more. No super infection here. Under appropriate conditions, again, it's going to go through that lytic cycle where it just makes copies and busts out of cells and gets into cells and makes copies and busts out of cells. So when it's in the prophage, when it's hiding inside the genetic genome, that process of going from the prophage back into the lytic cycle when it comes off of the chromosome and reactivates is referred to as induction. So there's some interesting bacteria out there that are infected by viruses and actually are pretty mean bacteria because of the viral infection. Um, Salmonella, um, some of them you can tell if they have a particular viral infection because their lipopolysaccharide structure changes because that virus, again, is producing stuff that changes their outer membrane. In the case of diphtheria, that particular disease, um, the bacteria that causes that disease, Coronibacterium diphtheria, not all of the bacteria have the ability to produce the toxin. The toxin is actually because of a viral infection, of a prophage that actually codes for the diphtheria toxin. The bad news for us is most of the Coronibacterium diphtheria bacteria out there right, way back when got infected by this virus, so they have this prophage, they have this ability to produce this toxin, which is the contributor to the disease that causes um, the problems with diphtheria infection. But you can think of virus for that. So, in eukaryotic cells, um, when viruses get in, sometimes they don't necessarily kill the cell. They'll cause um, changes in the cell, what we call cytopathic uh, effects. So as we know, they can harm our cells. Animal viruses in particular can cause degenerative changes and abnormalities in tissues that are distinct from lysis, right? So these are our cytopathic effects. So here are our choices, right? We could have a good old standard viral infection, right? Bus out of our cells, bus gets into new cells, right? And it's a pretty fast moving infection. Usually, eventually, pretty quickly, our immune system gets a hold of it and can eliminate the virus completely from the body. Other viruses, unfortunately, become latent, right, where they can hide inside of our cells. The bad news with these latent viruses, they can activate and go into the lytic cycle and cause damage. And then many latent viruses, like the chickenpox virus and the herpes virus, which are in the same family, we can never get rid of them. Once you have them, they're in your cells, you can't get rid of them. And they can reactivate depending on circumstances, usually related to your immune system. That's what keeps us all in check. Yeah, I mean, stress factors are, are major contributors to um, ineffective immune ability. And then you have chronic infections. So what's the difference between acute and chronic? Acute is what? Short-term, fast, right? Mm -hmm. Chronic is therefore long-term and slow. So some viruses just slowly pop out of our cells, right, over very long periods of time. So you don't get that real serious infection, right? Uh, you don't realize how sick you are, right, until you've been sick for a long time. Anyone know what viruses tend to fall into this category that you might be aware of? Whoop. Now, flu is pretty acute infection, believe it or not. Although it feels like forever when you have it, right? <laughs> no, we're talking about a virus. What virus replicates really slowly, doesn't cause a really fast onset? 
Mono. HIV is definitely a slow chronic disease. Mono, I think, would maybe fall into that category of slow. Hepatitis. A lot of uh, hepatitis B and C tend to be chronic type infections, long term. And then the worst that we fear, right, that these changes by the virus can cause our cells to transform and become malignant cancer cells, what I term cells behaving badly, right? They've been disrupted in such a way that they're now doing things that they're not supposed to do and not doing their job anymore that we need them to do. So several viruses have been linked to this. Anyone know what virus has been linked to cancer? HPV. HPV, which is human papilloma viruses. And there's a lot of them out there. Um, but specifically as it relates to the cervix for females, right, because you can't just look at that baby whenever you want, right? you got to go once a year, get those cells checked out, get the little pap smear done, right, little swab, right, look at them microscopically, make sure you don't have any cells behaving badly, right? And the unfortunate thing is that, you know, it could be something as simple as a, a very common viral infection that's in the environment for us. So the good news is that there is some protection, right, against some of the human papilloma viruses that you can be vaccinated. The specifics of how the vaccine works, I do not know. I have not investigated. So why is it that it can damage and even cause cell death? Well, obviously it's going to inhibit our DNA and RNA synthesis processes. Um, it can disrupt our lysosomes. Remember, these are hydrolytic enzymes that are going to help us in digestion safely within the endosome, right? When that lysosome bursts, then the cell is going to be um, deteriorated. They'll alter our membranes. And when they do this, a lot of times our immune system is going to attack, right? That influenza virus starts putting its hemogluten and neuroaminodase in our membrane to make its envelope. Well, our immune system recognizes those proteins and attacks and kills those cells. And this is where the influenza vaccine helps you, is that we're trying to hopefully give you a clue. We're like, this is what hemagglutinase and neuroaminodase look like this year, right? Here's a couple of examples of what we think that protein is going to look like this year. So your immune system starts making products starts making cells ahead of time that recognize this. So that if you get infected, you already know what the bad guy looks like and you can respond that much faster. Maybe even to the point you don't even know you got it. Right? But how long does it take from the time you got the flu vaccine to you actually have protection? Two weeks. Seven to 14 days right, is the range that it takes your immune system under ideal conditions to get ready for the bad guy. So you go get the shot, you don't walk out and think, oh, I'm all set, right? It's going to take time. And then again, we're playing a lottery, right? Did we get it right? Did we give you the right numbers, right? Did we give you the right versions of the proteins that are out there? These guys mutate and change yearly. This is why we get a new vaccine each year. So as our cells are morphed by the viral infection, our immune system, if it detects, is going to attack. Um, but also these changes can cause our cells to fuse. Toxicity from high concentrations of the viral proteins will build up in our cells and maybe even kill our cells. Formation of inclusion bodies, these are the viruses starting to assemble, um, can really disrupt our cell structure. And then the worst case scenario, right, is if it disrupts our cells so much, especially our chromosome, that it becomes a cancerous malignant cell. So this last picture, um, I stole from the internet um, to give you guys an example of an inclusion body. Uh, remember, we use the term inclusion bodies for um, bacteria, right, how they package stuff sometimes. Um, but this is in a different inclusion body. These are referred to viruses inside of our cells. And rabies virus forms a particular specific inclusion body that can be recognized under the microscope. 
Um, it might be hard to see. Well, actually, on my, on my screen it's hard to see, but on the screen up there it's pretty easy. You see this little pink mass right here? So there's one inclusion body right there, and there are three in this cell. So these are, uh, it's like Purkinje cells, those are associated with the nervous system. So this will infect, right, our nervous cells travel to the brain and infect the cells. Uh, so scientists, when they're looking for uh, rabies infection, they'll actually do, as you see here, they'll make um, preparations, they'll stain them, and they're looking for these congregations, these inclusion bodies that are specific to rabies. The name of the inclusion bodies for rabies is the nigra body, right? So if they see nigra bodies, that's bad news, that's rabies. Um, what do you avoid in Louisiana as it relates to wild animals and rabies? <coughs> raccoons. Stay away from the cute little raccoons. All right, y'all. So as I said earlier, I'll be posting the next one, which is genetics. Hopefully sometime, yeah, 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 it's not posted yet.